क्यों क्या हुआ नहीं आ रहा ठीक है कल आ जाएगा नो 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 नीड नो नीड नो नीड हाँ हाँ डोंट वरी ओके या
তাহলে আমার এটা বন্ধ করব হাই প্রফেসর বিশ্বাস হাউ আর ইউ স্যার হাই গুড ইভিনিং হাউ আর ইউ আই এম ফাইন স্যার গুড ইভিনিং এ গুড টু সি ইউ সো স্টার্ট শেয়ারিং ইওর স্ক্রিন স্যার very good sir hello yeah we can see you sir ha ah, you can see yes yeah happy, yeah we can happy to see yeah yeah very happy sir <laughs> okay in fact i was just uploading your uh, tracheobronchial foreign bodies to the website so okay. still going on in the background <laughs> because the my connection got uh, disconnected so i had to again download from the live feed and then uh, work on it on the software before i could make it into a video so i have uploaded it uh, so it should be uploaded by the time we finish this talk so yeah. then i'll share it with you sir how are things in uh, calcutta sir calcutta is calcutta city of joy <laughs> people are happy no but with the current scenario are they going to lift the restrictions uh, uh, next so week the small small shops have been given permission those uh-huh. who are in green zone but okay. uh, other parts are in trouble oh i see what is the number what is the number at the moment of mortality number, cases uh, in calcutta numbers are not too high not too bad but then uh not difficult because a tested uh, number uh, may not be very high okay so there's the issue with the testing at the moment isn't it not enough testing being done yes yes sir there is a major issue so uh, clinical parameters are there but then the huge population population density is very high you well, already know so to get this is of course yeah. such a crowded city yeah it's very crowded isn't it it's still it's still yes come on action dada ah dada <laughs> nice oh dr sampat kumar how are you sir welcome welcome dada I simply like your uh, name thoracic mahaguru wonderful <laughs> this that is... is the mahaguru is only for professor uh, biswas oh. we are all thoracic gurus but mahaguru only for professor biswas <laughs> say that oldest man <laughs> good i am waiting to listen to you i you have been doing a lot of lectures as well sir i i have been seeing on the cardiac front the youngsters are very very thankful to you for doing some very good lectures sir i'm speaking to dr sampath kumar actually and uh, i had been to calcutta also to do some classes with bishwas mhm at times oh the last time uh, i did something on how to write a paper <laughs> how to write a oh, yes. publication yes that's very yeah. important for the youngsters yes. okay i will sign off and let baba to speak indeed we've got one more minute to go sir so we'll just wait uh,
Okay, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to another session of Thoracic Gurus. Uh, today, uh, again, we are fortunate to have uh, our super guru, <laughs> Thoracic Mahaguru, Professor Babatos Biswas, who has been kind enough to give us a uh, another day uh, and another lecture on this series. Uh, he's going to talk to us today about tropical thoracic surgery. So he's going to take us through all the infections and in, uh, all the inflammatory things that we see uh, across the tropics. Uh, Professor Bishwas, thank you very much for agreeing to talk on this uh, platform once again. The floor is all yours, sir. Uh, thank you. I'm delighted to meet again and again. And this is a nice platform that uh, uh, it is an issue to... Uh, learn and discuss, but more so we are meeting very frequently. So, uh, very, very enjoyable evening we are having. So, uh, today uh, the subject is uh, very simple or very complicated, whatever you put. This is every day what we face, but uh, the problems what we face in this part of the country, rather in this part of the world, we have got some common problem in these tropical areas. So for youngsters, I will just take them through what really I mean from this term. Tropical thoracic surgery means something special. So something uh, what the practicing surgeons in this part of the country and Zamir is a universal person. This is your place also, so, you know. So let us uh, look at this special area. So I believe youngsters uh, need to be introduced a little that uh, what is tropical area? What I mean by that? It is a region of earth lying between Tropic of Cancer and the Tropic of Capricorn. That is the area. So we are concerned about this geographical area. It has got some speciality. And those speciality makes uh, very, very relevant and useful from the angle of thoracic surgery. You are all uh, aware and you will agree with me that this area has got warm climate. A lot of poverty, lack of education, sanitation is relatively poor. And all these things provide ideal environment for pathogens, vectors, intermediate hosts to flourish. This is their very, very important playground and we are all victims. In this vast landmass, major cause of mort morbidity and mortality are respiratory infection. It is very, very common in this big area, this is a very common problem. And this is due to all common pathogens encountered anywhere in the world. That is one area. And other part, which is not common, which is different and specific for us, is mycobacterial, parasitic, fungal organism, especially those people who are immunocompromised or more susceptible. These are the special areas. This comes to our special credit. There are non-communicable disease that cannot be ignored. That is also with us. We have not left it, that is lung cancer. It is growing high due to pollution and various other causes. Occupational lung disease, COPD is ever growing and chronic respiratory disease. So we have got burden of speciality of tropical area as well as non communal disorder. So we have got a huge burden. Uh, some of them are really coming to the field of thoracic surgery. So clinically significant pulmonary involvement occurs due to wide range of protozoal and helminthic infestations. I will spend some time, but normally, tuberculosis, infection, chronic, all these infection and other things, we are absolutely concerned and discuss every day. But a couple of times, we get clinical scenario which are not related to usual bacteria. And uh, maybe tubercular, maybe non tubercular this is out of that area, and those are due to protozoa and helmin. These are not very common, not happening every day, but it comes and if we are not careful, we are not concerned that these diseases can happen, it will be really trouble for us to handle. So I'm uh, just in, uh, noting here a couple of important issues, which are though infrequent, but all of us practicing in this part of the world encounter. May not be very frequently throughout the year, but at least a couple of times every year, we have to handle these issues and these are very interesting in that sense that it is not very common, something special. For a thoracic surgeon, in your plate, you get some of these dishes sometimes in the year. So let me uh, tell you a couple of examples. These are uh, what uh, we have experienced during our clinical practice. 
one is Ascaricius. This, uh, this is uh, well known for everybody. Everybody doing clinical practice, they know about this. And they produce solitary pulmonary nodules. Many times, we do all exercise to identify what is the cause and unable to locate. And that is the problem. If it doesn't come in mind that this innocent worm, not innocent, but a worm which is not supposed to be of the interest of thoracic surgeon may put us to trouble by producing solitary pulmonary nodule and sometimes lobar collapse. Every sort of investigation done, but unable to understand. And if it can be identified, metronidazole and albendazole, they are absolutely mahusari. This is a great medicine. Simply suspicion, making sure and treat with medicine. And there is no role of surgery in this sort of lung involvement. So solitary pulmonary nodule or lower collapse due to ascariasis. It is treated by medicines only. Only thing we have to know that if you don't find any other cause, please don't forget it. This is the message for my young friends. Next come hookworm. That is very common for clinical practitioner, medicine, internal medicine, general practitioners. They come across every day. But this worm can produce patchy alveolar infiltrates. If a patient comes with patchy infiltrates, we can think of so many things, tuberculosis, uh, common infection, but we have to keep it in mind. If you fail to identify any other organ responsible for this, this is the cause and treatment is same. Mebendazole, albendazole, all this anti helminthic and then no role of surgery in this group of disorders also. This is another area. This is not common, but we encounter at least one case per year we get. That is Strongyloidiasis. Here, focal or bilateral interstitial infiltrates or sometimes to effusion, maybe up to 40% patients. Whenever, let me tell you otherwise, bilateral interstitial infiltration or to effusion, many times we are unable to identify cause. So, this is the disease which may cause this and it may end in lung abscess also. At least 10 to 15% of lung abscess this may be responsible. So it is though uncommon, but not very rare. In clinical practice, in busy centers, in tertiary care centers and medical colleges, particularly those centers who cater mass population, poor population, unhygienic population, who fall of nutrition, short of nutrition, in those category of people, this is fairly common. At least we encounter a couple of cases every year. And this is oral, Ivernectin is the drug. Here, there is also no role of surgery. So let us see a couple of other things. Tropical pulmonary eosinophilia. This is fairly common known. It is treated by physicians only. Somebody referred. It goes by tropical pulmonary eosinophilia. It produces reticular nodular opacities. Sometimes miliary opacities you can see. Sometimes it may come as bronchitis also. And here treatment is also medical treatment dithyl carbamazin and no role of surgery. This is another area where you are just made full. We are searching for everything, all investigation, big investigation, modern investigation, scanning, all serology, but finally just strong suspicion, particularly when the patient is coming from that area, that is tropical, real tropical area. And uh, it has been observed that people traveling from tropical area to other parts of the world, they also present with this disease sometimes. Trichinella infection, they produce pulmonary infiltrates and memendazole is therapy. And cystodomiasis here, chest radiograph and CT scan may show ground glass opacities. The Prezzyquintel, the drug which is used in hydrated also, this is used here also. Paragonimiasis, this is the organism, protozoa that causes Patchy infiltration, nodal opacities, dual effusion, and opacity abutting visceral pleura. It is very, very, you know, very, very pinpointing radiological sign. Only radiologists can identify. And those thoracic surgeons who are exposed to this population, they get sometimes. And Prezzyquintel is a drug. And uh, here also there is no role of surgery. And regarding another echinococcus, there is another that we have discussed 
in great details. Definitely, we'll touch a little bit of Echinococcus special areas today also. And so I am not discussing yet. It has been discussed in details, and again, we'll touch it. And uh, this is mesomycosis of uh, rhinosporidiosis. They cause entobronchial lesions, undiagnosed entobronchial lesions, all major failed. So CT image may show endobronchial lesion. So when everything fails, you may think of as a uh, cause for this. And what I mean to say that all these sort of disorders caused by protozoa and parasite, they should be kept in mind. They come, they come as a last option in the list of differential diagnosis, but they cannot be forgotten. If we forget it, those persons who are practicing, those young friends who are practicing in tropical areas, particularly people with poverty, malnutrition, infectious environment, they will be missing in making a diagnosis and treating a group of disorders belonging to category every year. So within the big list, I will be discussing a couple of cases uh, who are not uh, very common, but uh, in day-to-day -day practice, at least a couple of cases will get every year. Those young friends who are practicing in tropical area, literally uh, not, uh, say, I should say, these are the cases coming to medical colleges, coming to crowded areas, coming to public hospitals, coming to municipal hospitals. Uh, so these cases reach there. So this should be kept in mind. So pulmonary strongular disease, it causes lung invasion. But because the larva carried by bloodstream to the right heart and then to the lung. And what they call bronchopneumonia, alveolar hemorrhage, lung abscess, and even hemoptysis. I remember at least a couple of experiences of mine encountered with lung abscess and hemoptysis, but nothing could be identified. Finally, needed surgery. And putting everything together, I was a uh, final diagnosis are made that is due to this uh, parasite. Treatment is simple. Ordinarily, if it is not surgically very advanced, the lung damage is not a very high degree. It is treated thiobendazole, anti-helminthic, and sometimes albendazole. These are the two common medicines, thiobendazole at the dose of 25 mg per kg twice a day. Only two days therapy is enough. And albendazole 400 twice daily, means 10 to 15 mg per kg of body weight, which is a five days. If it is identified in the beginning without much lung parenchymal damage happened, up to that time treatment is simple. But beyond that, it needs lung resection, and after that, you can make a diagnosis. Tropical pulmonary eosinophilia. This, this, this is I should discuss. I have a couple of experience of this. This is by filaria. This is very rare now. It is not encountered frequently in our country now, but it comes. The microfilaria in lymphatics invade pulmonary circulation and lung parenchyma and produces further granulomatous and fibrosing pattern. Chest tests I give you a picture like miliary nodules mimicking miliary tuberculosis. Sometimes we confuse with miliary tuberculosis. Multiple miliary nodules you get in chest x and CT that may be due to this TPE, tropical pulmonary eosinophilia. That must be kept in mind. And finally, it is confirmed by histopathology. If lung resection is finally done, the histopathology shows microfilaria. If it is identified early, before a lot of damage has been done, then treatment of filaria, diethyl carbamazine, the 6 mg per kg day for three weeks. It comes in the name of etazine. It is simple therapy. Uh, sometimes back, it was used empirically when nothing uh, evidence could be evidence. Uh, it is not fair to give empirically, but there are clinical evidences where you can suspect, particularly in endemic areas, particularly in tropical areas. Uh, this is, you know, in India, in tropical country, it is not uncommon. Malaria is still a problem, though it is largely under control, but quite some time we get patients with complication of malaria. All various the complication of malaria are, uh, you know, every year uh, comes in clinical practice. And uh, normally malaria doesn't come under the purview of the surgeons. We don't have to do anything, but we are not totally away from them. Sometimes these are the cases known as pulmonary malaria. A patient comes with cough, dyspnea, 
sometimes end in fatal ARDS, acute respiratory distress syndrome, malaria, could not be diagnosed, and uh, suspicion of malaria. If treated adequately, it is cured, but yeah, that is also a problem that I am coming just now. That cough, dyspnea, fatal ARDS, sometimes non cardiogenic pulmonary edema or intra alveolar hemorrhage. These are the presenting symptoms and signs. If a patient in malaria have got or either of these symptoms and signs, a patient classical malarial symptoms with this lung problems, it's just a very variable. It may not be highly informative. It may not give a lot of clues. Sometimes you get lower consolidation. Sometimes you get pleural effusion. Sometimes alveolar infiltrate, suggesting pulmonary edema and pulmonary hemorrhage. So X-ray gives variable pattern. So putting these two things together, normal malarial clinical feature plus these features plus X-ray finding, there is strong suspicion. And if you go through malarial diagnostic protocol, you may be able to identify this is pulmonary malaria. If it is, treatment is absolutely simple. Parental quinine is drug of choice. And RT mesonine is the alternative where quinine is contraindicated. You know, quinine has got some uh, you know, uh, connection with cardiac issues. So quinine is the drug of choice. So important thing is it has to be suspected. Malaria, not respiratory therapy, having chest problems, having some evidence in chest X-ray, we must think of pulmonary malaria and must be treated. If it is identified, it will be treated and patients are saved. Next, pulmonary amyosis. It is in terms of histolytica, that is colitis, and liver. It's very common in our practice. Lung involvement occurs usually due to extension of amyosis liver abscess through the diaphragm and reaching the pleura and lung. Hematogenous spread and aspirations have rarely been reported, not unknown, but it is rare. Ordinarily, it is due to amyosis liver abscess. The ruptures goes to the diaphragm, enters the pleural cavity, enters the lung. It presents as pulmonary abscess, and the pus is ankyloviscous. As all my young friends know, this is ankyloviscous. That is chocolate-colored pus that is aspirated from the liver abscess. So liver abscess, lung abscess come together, and this is due to entangle. Chest X-ray comes with lung consolidation, and as the early X evidence, you can find hemidiaphragm disease. So there's the hemidiaphragm lung consolidation with evidences of recurrent attacks of colitis. So these are the evidences. So treatment of, uh, sometimes in time of you might find sputum, stool, or pleural pus. So it has got a lot of evidences. Only thing we have to keep in mind. We cannot forget about the importance of this culprit. If it is in mind, it can be diagnosed and it can be treated. Treatment is simple. Metronidazole is widely effective. Its usefulness has been widely accepted. So there are alternative drugs now in the same family, Pinatazole and other members of that committee. So what they do, all these parasites and protos are what I discussed. My young friends may think these are hypo the things I'm talking. This is not funny. Yes, dear friends, it is. it comes in uh, regular practice. But it is a special problem of tropical countries. It is tropical thoracic surgery, tropical thoracic disease. They may have range of uh, infestation at different sites, like the steatobronchial problem, like a pulmonary parenchyma, rural space, just all about that we have already discussed. But sometimes lung constitution, sometimes infiltration, solitary pulmonary nodule, endobronchial tubercular, tubercles, then rural space collection, then sometimes that may invade the chest wall also. So all the components starting from chest wall up to the tracheobronchial tea, everything can be involved by these parasites which are normally not expected to come in contact with the uh, thoracic uh, organs. The clinical manifestations are very wide range, maybe non-specific, leading to diagnostic and therapeutic dilemmas. But whatever symptoms and signs they have that may not pinpoint towards the chest issues, treatment must majority of these disorders very, very fortunately may be self-limiting. It, it may settle itself and majority of them are treated medically. Role of surgery is limited to a small group of patients who has got 
parenchymal damage of the lung or other organ or producing lung abscess or pleural effusion or empyema but it has got additive role with medicine medicine is primary treatment it has to be added with that with this background let me take you through the common issues which come every day when thoracic surgery this we discuss every day thoracic surgery has a three years one before 1950 and one period between 1950 to 1990 that is uh, when the thoracic surgery growth was very explosive and 1990 onwards till last 30 years it is all refinement now lot of newer techniques and newer issues have come with an all refinement of surgery taken place during this time but this surgery of chest that is thoracic surgery before 1950 was for tuberculosis only mostly tuberculosis some cases are definitely infective disease or cancer but mostly it was tuberculosis and pulmonary tuberculosis should be rightly said as history of thoracic surgery everything started with tuberculosis other things are very very infrequent the first thoracic surgical procedure was open drainage of pleural empyema by hippocrates is so old operation are mostly done for infectric condition and it was a last resort nothing was available no major available only then people thought yes let us go for surgery and that was in the form of collapse therapy mostly the cavity in the lung or lesion in the lung if that portion of lung undergo collapse that disease will not flourish and that is the philosophy and that product of plumbed pneumothorax then phrenic nerve uh, crushing then thoracoplasty all this modality of therapy finally aimed at collapsing lung so collapse therapy was the fundamental therapy and this was meant to address tuberculosis lung disease mostly cavity and other lesions related to tuberculosis so prerequisite for development of thoracic surgery as the surgery started advancing these things are required to be done knowledge about thorax become remembered people started learning the anatomy and physiology of chest then how to do hemostasis because during thoracic surgery a lot of bleeding and uh, lung isolation and the knowledge of asepsis and antisepsis with the advent and development of thoracic surgery all these issues became important that this was taken as primary important issues and this is known that uh, really lung dissection started after graham did in 1923 saxon lovick in 19 23 and perfection came up to 1930 the technique of lung dissection lovick said it in perfected in 1930 with this background now i'll try to take my friends through some common tropical diseases which we encounter every day in clinical practice whatever i have discussed till now so that uncommon irregular encountered and treatment is largely medicine unless it does it causes Uh, parenchyma lung damage surgery is not indicated that is one subset now i am coming with a common subset which our friends handle every day so these are the areas where we are interested for surgeons come to play with these different areas so tuberculosis in different forms i will come through a couple of them and hydatid cyst already discussed but still i will touch some medicinal tumors and obviously those are non infective ones and lung cancer bulla cle cyst all these things will come so if we make a list this is the list which we commonly encounter in tropical thoracic surgical practice every day and couple of cases which i discussed earlier those are very very uncommon clinical scenario but not unknown not unreported you cannot forget that but this is the primary important areas which you have to handle every day So regarding tuberculosis lot of things have been discussed in uh, on different days and uh, last couple of days yesterday also discussed that divan was there so dr ali dr divan and uh, other surgeons everywhere discussed tuberculosis is still the major area covering thoracic surgery one part is tuberculosis another part is malignancy so both are equally important but probably in tropical areas tuberculosis still makes the maximum number and maximum volume of thoracic surgical patients here we have to specially discuss about empyema little bit and some bronchiectasis some destroyed lung these areas have been discussed time and again and i feel that every discussion every minute there is something to talk about this 
in every clinician practicing for a sick surgery must be coming in these diseases in different forms every day. So, whatever you discuss about these diseases, that is not exhaustive, that is not uh, complete. So, something new will come every day. So, let us see empyema. Empyema, particularly, we are interested about chronic empyema. Early stage of empyema can be treated by medicine, can be treated by uh, physicians by uh, putting some drugs inside, but challenges are when it is chronic. There's the extensive lung addition, multi lobular collection, peak crudal peel, broadly disease underlying lung, multiple cases areas, bilateral disease, extensive crudal addition, and patients who had previous thoracotomies, and certainly those patients who are medically unfit, having poor morbids and bad risk. So if you look at the X-ray, various types of X-ray you find, a simple chest X-ray will give you a lot of information. It may be empyema necessities. Not very common today, but in our clinical practice, this sort of classical pictures will be fine. It is empyema, peak wall, localized empyema. It has come out through the chest wall and it is making subcutaneous. Empyema. So this is empyema necessities. It is a very classical picture. You don't get every day, but this is not unknown, not unknown today. And treatment is definitely this patient will need surgery and adequate antitubular therapy. Regarding surgery, a lot of things have been discussed and definitely will be discussed every day. This patient of empyema, a candidate for surgery and antitubular therapy. Another case of empyema where that is local altered collection, thick peel, collapsed lung, consolidation. So you'll get different types of empyema. So this empyema, very thick peel, uh, thick collection, lung is totally compressed and almost not seen at all. In different parts of city, you'll find the consolidated lung somewhere. And fortunately, most of these lungs come up after decortication as a matter of routine treatment, we'll discuss a little bit. But different sort of empyema, but in this case, we understand this post pneumonic empyema. So it is here, it has come out. This pneumonectomy was done. That's another very, very special problem. We have done pneumonic, but the right side pneumonectomy and space collection, space empyema is not infrequent. Sometimes it becomes like this, communicating with the abscess outside. And sometimes we get patients who develop this, these abscess ruptures, the discharging sinus. A patient coming with discharging sinus with abscess in subcutaneous plane and collection in pleural cavity, and the patient had a history of pneumonectomy. So this is a very, very difficult clinical situation, but a lot of ways to handle this patient. And these are not uncommon, not unknown. Still, we live with this patient in this part of the world. So this is another patient. This is not very difficult patient. And uh, in earlier discussion, we discussed in extensively or bilateral empyema, there is also uncommon clinical identity, but not unknown. These patients need to be worked out thoroughly, need to be identified, need to be treated. So these are common practice. And regarding empyema, I will spend just two minutes here. Empyema, if it is acute empyema, that is in the purview of physician. As a surgeon, what we feel, and I should convey uh, my feeling to all my young stars, that putting a chest in properly and managing it properly, handling properly, will be able to take care of majority of the empyema. T2 under empyema, you have to allow the pus to drain out, allow the lung to expand, but adequate chest physiotherapy and adequate medical therapy in the form of anti antibiotics. These three way attack will keep the empyema treated and lung expanded. But if it is established empyema with thick peel, non expanded lung, the options are we have to do decortication, either open thoracotomy or minimal invasive. And decortication may allow you to see expanded lung. If after decortication you find that some area lung is damaged, don't keep that lung. So decortication with lung resection, of minimal resection, maybe weight, maybe low, and sometimes segment. This may be effective in majority of the patient. Sometimes whole lung is totally damaged. After decortication, you find that nothing in the lung, lung is not expanding at all, lot of holes, lot of bronchial fistula. Then you take out the lung, that goes by the name of pleuro-pneumonectomy. The entire thing is taken out, and the bronchial stump is covered with a vascularized muscle flap. 
so this is the usual treatment and if it is not that bad these are the you know open surgery as i told you it can be done proposcopically so these are relatively uh, a couple of cases this is a picture of a baby for i am not just uh, showing videos for the sake of time so most of the empyema either by thoracotomy or by minimal invasive heads or robots it can be done nicely lung expansion fully only thing we have to assess that lung expansion is adequate to fill up the cavity and if there are bronchial holes so bronchial orifices should be closed bronchopleural fistula should be managed and underlying diseased lung solid lung bronchial lung must be resected so this is the trick and after the surgery is done adequate chest physiotherapy nebulization and uh, lung expansion maneuvers must be done properly and uh, sometimes you need to clear the airway by putting uh, bronchoscope so a couple of pictures have shown and uh, now let us shift to another area that is surgery in pulmonary tuberculosis with the advent of effective chemotherapy and early diagnosis now most of the tb is diagnosed early pulmonary tuberculosis is diagnosed early and uh, once it is diagnosed tuberculosis drugs are very good either first line second line for uh, first issue or the uh, maybe multi drug resistance so drugs are very very effective once diagnosis made adequate drug therapy should be started there are a couple of indication where surgery is essential for tuberculosis that is it is massive hemoptysis that is the common indication here we have to localize the disease or lateralize it is right side or left side which is upper lobe or lower lobe this has to be absolutely located before surgery and section sometimes we have to take undertake uh, emergency surgery if it is bronchiectatic of a lobe or it is cavity it is simple sometimes both lungs are well expanded ct doesn't show anything you have to put bronchoscope repeatedly find out the lesion and you have to undertake surgery here i must mention about the issue is and discussed time and again that is bronchial atrial embolization for massive hemoptysis is a got some limited role it allow you to purchase some time patient is settled temporarily by this time you invested extensively and in this surgery so it may help you to overcome the emergency situation and uh, as per geloma that is most commonly it is present in the heel tubercular cavity and diabetic patients are more susceptible so in a tubercular cavity not necessarily it must be always always tubercular so it is usually tubercular maybe in non tubercular cavity in the lung that may harbor a uh, uh, bacterial uh, that is fungal uh, cavity inside so the fungus and surgical treatment is the treatment of choice if you look at the picture this is the classical picture of aspergillosoma here you can see the classical ct scan of aspergillosoma so aspergillosoma is a condition where this happens in the pre existing cavity made by tuberculosis sometimes non tubercular cavity and surgical therapy in the form of lobectomy is the standard mode of therapy and the very thick wall tubercular cavity this i have discussed earlier also thick wall cavity and up came with profuse hemoptysis and after resection lobectomy see huge cavity very thick wall having a big fungal ball so as per you know fungal ball it is very very uh, common in our country and that and it and uh, these cases let me tell you two issues this is sequelae of tuberculosis when this patient came most of them are not having active tuberculosis then the majority unless proved otherwise biopsy shows active tuberculosis or some clinical evidences anti tubercular drugs are not indicated and majority of the cases anti fungals are not also indicated because a lot of studies of different nature have been published but ordinarily this cavity harbors fungus which comes from here these are hyphae and they are not systemic fungosis it is not systemic fungal infection so it neither requires anti tubercular nor anti fungal but uh, not that it never requires but in specific case it may be required having specific indication but ordinarily these are sequelae of tuberculosis not active tuberculosis not going anti tubercular drug so ordinarily they don't need anti tubercular don't need anti fungal but sir this treatment is best and tracheal bronchial sleeve resection for tracheal bronchial tree is sometimes you see this is sleeve resection this this is slope 
and we don't want to resect the whole lung. So this is resected and this is reconstructed with another this is also tubercular issue. Sometimes in active pulmonary tuberculosis, you need to undertake surgery. This needs to be taken very carefully. It has been discussed exhaustively, but I'm touching that failure in chemotherapy or sometimes progression of disease despite adequate therapy or relapse. These are the areas where it should be treated. And curative surgical resection is indicated for localized resectable disease with putum positive despite at least four months supervised chemotherapy. Two or more relapses following chemotherapy. One hour relapse while being on chemotherapy. These are absolutely classical points you have to remember before undertaking surgery during active tuberculosis. Repeated defaults or non-compliance. Like relapse in the judgment in treating physicians and many patients operated upon for sequel or complication turn out to be harboring active disease. So these are the areas where surgery is indicated in tuberculosis. And this is one of the classical CT and X-ray picture where you need to undertake surgery. Here it is a cavity, sputum positive, patient adequate medical therapy, it is not effective. So you resect it, bacterial load goes, cavity goes, and patient cures. So this classic example. When we are undertaking surgery, we have to keep a couple of things in mind. Extra pleural mobilization is required in many cases of extensive addition. This is not routine, but particularly in peripheral areas, parietal areas, extra pleural mobilization becomes mandatory to start with the procedure, especially in upper lobulation. A bronchial stump closure, both are equally effective. If you are comfortable in mechanical stapling or hand swing, both are equally effective, both are equally safe. But after closing bronchus, we must make sure that bronchus is not made avascular by multiple sutures or uh, by using cautery or it is keeping leak or the bronchial stump is still holding disease. The stumping or suturing should not be done through diseased area and it should not be avascular. These are the tricks we should remember to avoid bronchial fistula. And uh, that's inexperienced hand definitely is inappropriate, but in the experience, hats and robots are very excellent alternatives, but young friends with experience definitely take it slowly and become expert in this. So challenging in view of significant addition, distortion of anatomy, and what I started feeling after long experience in old age, that minimally invasive surgery, probably better option in handling this extensive addition, extensive distortion, but that must be built up with expensive experience of handling. So somebody with experience may be more comfortable with bats and robots. There are a couple of issues which are not contraindication, but relatively should be taken with uh, a pinch of salt. It should be taken very seriously. If it is bilateral extensive disease, active disease at the proposed bronchial stem site, you cannot afford to switch at this phase, so you have to modify it, innovate. Very poor general condition, unfit for general anesthesia, poor nutrition. These are the areas where you must be careful. And today, we can very safely say all the diseases are amenable for thoracic surgery. Whatever area where surgery is useful can be done. We have to take measures. We have to take precautions. We have to be equipped with techniques and measures and gadgets, medicine but we should be able to handle all sorts of disease which require surgery. There's no need to be afraid that no, 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 it cannot be operated. Those days are gone. You can operate all the operative lesions, but you have to be equipped. You have to be equipped with medicines and technology. So post-op complications, sometimes after lung dissection, you develop space empyema or uh, empyema in the remaining cavity. A process problem, it is definitely uh, associated and problems are different in and malignant disease. After that, let me touch a little bit of bronchiectasis. This is a well-discussed picture. Many times with bilateral disease, this side and that side. This side which is more involved and CT-wise and investment-wise so to be active disease, having a lot of infection, that side needs to be operated. But all the patients must be prepared properly. These wet lung patients must be prepared properly with steam inhalation, with nebulization, with postural drainage, with chest physiotherapy. Before the patient taken on table, chest preparation must be adequate. Otherwise, as soon as patient is turned on one side, all the stuff 
goes into the other lung, there is chance. In spite of double lumen endotic altitude, there is some chance of getting the material in the other side and then the cut the lung. So patients must be prepared very adequately. Lung abscess is not a routine case for surgery, but sometimes a very aggressive clinical lung abscess, whole lung, a lobe or a portion of the lung may be absolutely rotten. They may need emergency surgery, but that is very infrequent seizure and not required. High dead teeth is a common tropical disease. I will touch a couple of points here. The cystic specialization, lung, lung, liver, and other organs, every organ can be involved. And uh, tropical area, tropical countries are very prone to have disease. And uh, our interest is mostly echinococcus granulosa. That is the common uh, echinococcus we are infect, infested with. And multi localities give you recurrent multiple lesions. So, a couple of points, you know, human being uh, is the, uh, you know, accidental host. The economist doesn't want to come in human being. If it comes, there is the end of life, but this is life cycle. This I discussed earlier. And what I want to say, you will get varieties. This is water lily sign. That is not common, but sometimes you get. And uh, you get in varieties of shock. These lesions should be identified. It is space over lesion, the clean margin. It might be anything, any space of evolution. It should be identified clearly. X-ray gives you very good information, overlapping shadows. Sometimes it is ruptured and effusion. And CT scan give you very good information. This is a very clear cut picture. Mediastinal hydrosis rupturing into the airway. And the material gets cuffed out. And I will touching that uh, in a couple of minutes. Another hydrated seat causing damage of the lung. So lung and liver bilateral lung with liver is also very common. So hydrate cyst may come in different forms. And as we discussed earlier also, ultrasound therapy gives a fair idea about the classification that helps to plan therapy. When the cyst is inactive or cyst is non-homogeneous, these stages of cyst, the inactive, that little chance of spreading or producing daughter cyst. In the earlier stage, there is co-populating with medicine. Albendazole is very good therapy. In early cyst, non-infected cyst, non-complete cyst, single cyst, small cyst, medical therapy may be curative in some cases, not all, but once it is multiple cysts, recurrent cysts, infective cysts, complicated cysts, surgery become mandatory. And treatment, I'm telling one again and again, that albendazole is treatment of choice, 15 mg per kg of body weight in two divided doses. It should be started a couple of weeks before surgery and continue for several months, depending on type of hydratid. If it is multiple hydrated, multi organ hydrated, recurrent hydrated, complete hydrated, it needs to be continued for longer time. And we must remember if we continue almidazole, we must keep a very, very close eye on liver function. The liver enzyme must be noted very carefully. And uh, for surgery, it has to be started a couple of weeks before and continued for a couple of uh, months after that. And peer therapy, all you know, percutaneous aspiration. Infusion of cholesterol agent and re aspiration. It is indicated in uncomplicated cysts, the C1, C2, and sometimes C3. So, early cases either only medical therapy or medical therapy with pair, and late cases, complicated cases, delayed cases, multiple cases, recurrent cases, multi organ cases, surgery therapy, but definitely under cover of almondazole. So, this is about uh, hydratid, presequential indicator sometimes, and uh, removal of. Hydrate cyst under albendazole, is it treatment standard mode of therapy? Lung dissection is required. Any very, very selected cases. Lung is conservated, lung is uh, protected. In even major cyst, once the cyst is removed and bronchial orifices are closed, lung expands. So lung dissection must be reserved for very selected cases. And this is a standard barrett technique of taking out. And this is the Lung and liver cyst, this is liver. After removing lung cyst, the diaphragm is cut, cyst is removed, the cavity is cleaned, and then both above and below. So I am not going to discuss, but I have a couple of issues to discuss here about hydrate cyst. Hydrate cyst complicated by rupture. It ruptures either in the bronchial tree or in the pleural space. These are very, very specific areas. And in clinical practice, our 10 thoracic surgeons, young surgeons, they will definitely come across in their lifetime in their practice. So it may rupture in the bronchus and the content of cyst may be coughed out. And that may be diagnostic point also. 
so both of the issues whether it is ruptured in bronchus or in pleural space so it needs to be uh, uh, but handled very carefully so treatment presents a challenge it causes significant pleural thickening parenchymal destruction injury in needs for decortication if it is in the pleural space in pyomatic decortication if the lung is damaged bronchiectomy then lung dissection so delayed an infected ruptured cyst in the pleura and if it is neglected not treated adequately may come with chronic empyema leading decortication and a neglected portion of the lung segment of lobe that may need lung dissection so if it is identified and treated early you can protect lung preserve lung if it is late you may end with this complication another area i want to touch is sometimes we get very very big cyst we use the term giant headed cyst by giant we mean that is more than 10 cm in size big cyst these cysts very interestingly they are commonly found in younger patients younger patients are more likely to have large cyst is really younger patients and these cyst become very big late presented and here lung tissue is more elastic young patient elastic lung healthy lung not fibrous getting a cyst and gradually increasing so these sort of giant cyst more than 10 cm are commoner and younger patient so any patient having minimal symptoms of lung that is cough pain and anything we must suspect particularly in endemic areas in tropical countries we must have one chest x ray that will suggest and that will help us to investigate properly and identify and don't allow this cyst to become giant so there are couple of issues we must remember the giant cyst it is more likely that it start to it is symptomatic up to certain state is absent in bending one become big it is symptomatic giant cyst has a more chance of rupture and once the giant cyst ruptures there is more need to resect lung in the form of lobectomy or segmentectomy a uh, very very rarely pneumonectomy some lung resection is relatively common in giant cyst giant head cyst can be treated successfully and complication rates are almost similar whether cyst is big or small complications are similar in number and in nature another issue i have discussing that's very important and uh, i think all senior pleural surgeons have got some experiences so this is bilio bronchial fistula this is not unknown sometimes we get these are very very complicated lead cases and not uh, not it is rare but not unknown this is the result of intrathoracic rupture of liver abscess a big liver abscess more so in the right lobe of liver ruptures passes to the dome of diaphragm which is the pleural cavity and the lower lobe of lung get involved so there is abscess in the lower lobe of lung and the liver and both are communicated bile comes to the lung and finally after aspiration of pus you get bile into this so liver abscess lung abscess and communicated together this is bilio bronchial fistula very difficult condition to it it ends in uh, treating it in a very very methodical manner patient present with repeated pneumonitis bilio abscess means vomiting out bile that may be presenting in sometimes so it may be presenting in this phase only the dyspnea bilio abscess repeated pneumonitis this may presenting picture of bilio bronchial fistula the surgical surgical removal is the treatment usually done by thoracotomy but many of the invasive options are also very good so thoracotomy sometimes thoracic abdominal incision may provide better access but i don't like this and i don't feel it necessary of, of course in earlier life i have taken this incision but now thoracotomy or thoracoscopy is useful in most of the cases we have to the pencil of surgery need to follow very carefully we have to evacuate the intrahepatic cyst the whole thing has to be drained cyst has to be obliterated the lung has to be dissected very carefully and thoroughly and resection and closure of the fistula and pulmonary parenchymal dissection may necessitate lung dissection ordinarily whatever i have experience in this disease i had to resect the lobe dual lobectomy with resection of the fistula sac and resection of the aspen cavity it was started with thoracotomy then resection of the lobe then passing to the phrenotomy entered liver abscess liver abscess was drained clean one drain was put 
in the subduction area in the lobe. Then lobectomy was done. That was damaged lobe, and then a drain was put in the chest. And these cases are notorious for recurrence. I had experience of getting recurrent patient, and that was also dissected and managed. So biliobronchial fistula is a common problem. Mostly, it is due to infected hydatid, but it may be due to some other liver abscess rupturing and reaching the lung also. This is an absolutely specific clinical entity, not uncommon, not very common also. It must be kept in mind. It is very treacherous to treat, but results is very good. Ultimate outcome is good. I will take one more issue that is non-tubercular granulotus lung disease, pulmonary involvement due to sarcoidosis and other granulotus disease which are non-tubercular may remain undiagnosed for a long time. That may present a dyspnea, uveitis, hepatosplenomegaly, critical lymphadenopathy, chronic condition. These are non-tubercular. Non-tubercular granulotus lesion. Chest X-ray may give you bilateral lymphadenopathy, biosome may confirmative. So you will get a group of disorder. Which fits in this category. It is non tubercular, it is granular matter. And biopsy may be confirmed before that. All investigations are useless and does not give you any idea. Medicinal tumors, this group of tumors, medicinal tumors, not infrequent that affect anti medicinum, middle medicinum, post medicinum. The majority of the cases, the aggression therapy is absolutely state and simple. Uh, and uh, these are the very, very, very simple anti medicinum. Supreme mediastinum, the posterior mediastinum, middle mediastinum, and uh, uh, the tumors or lesion in all mediastinum is fixed. Some may be malignant, some may be uh, benign. So, anti medicinal tumors are thymoma, thyroid, teratoma, tissue tumors. Regarding thymoma, we will not discuss that was discussed in length and breadth earlier. Posterior mediastinum tumor. Is usually lymphoma, teratoma, neurogenic tumor, or testicular tumors. So specific tumors are seen in different areas for long period of asymptomatic. Sometimes the symptomatic with chest pain, hemoptysis, dyspnea, all are non-specific symptoms. Diagnostic model is the same: chest X-ray, CT, FNC, metastasis. Sometimes bare, sometimes thoracotomy, sometimes sternotomy. All modes of uh, models are required. Sometimes EBAS, sometimes bronchoscopy. So all models are available. We have to Used judicially, but chest X ray give you primary information and CT is informed in most of the cases. It may take this step and may be confused with aneurysm. It may be like this, looks like medicinal widening. It may be like this. So, a couple of these tumors may be confused with aneurysmal structures. And uh, this is a nodular tumor, this one. And these are different forms of X ray and different forms of X ray. CT. This is CT cut. So you see, this is very, very solid tumor. And another, sorry, this is, yes. Uh, so these are the different varieties of medicinal tumor, a different size, different shape, and different weight. This is a very clean medicinal tumor. This can be shelled out very nicely. And treatment modality in surgery in most of the medicinal tumor is a necessity. And surgery can be done open and or by minimal invasive. But today's scenario, most of the medicinal tumors can be taken out very nicely and very safely by keyhole method, either by bats or robots. Both are equally effective. But some medicinal germ cell tumor, they may be responding to chemotherapy or radiotherapy. So what I suggest, once you get uh, some information about medicinal tumor on X-ray, it has to work out very thoroughly by CT scan, by bronchoscopy, and other modalities, and it must be a treatment plan. Treatment should be planned adequately. Surgery as well as radiotherapy and chemotherapy, all modalities should be taken into account. Some lymphoma that responds very nicely with medicine and chemotherapy. Neurogenic tumors are resectable, can be resected completely. And uh, these are all medicinal tumors. There is simple group of tumors, and uh, not most of the tumors are not very complicated. Can be managed nicely. And now I will touch a very very important issue, and uh, this is universal problem across the world. And the tropical countries are not uh, beyond the reach of this lung cancer. So this is very very unfortunate during this time. This corona reason, this pollution has gone because there is no. Cars uh, in the street, but this is pollution that causes this sort of problem. 
So cigarette smoking is the single most important cause of lung cancer. And if we just overview, we are not discussing cancer in details, but uh, if we overview, overall period of lung cancer is low because cases are presented late, they reach late. At the time of diagnosis of lung cancer, only 20% having local disease, the rest of the patients are delayed. More than 50% because of metastatic cancer, 25 are spread to regional lymph nodes, only 20% have a local disease only. Even in localized disease, overall five year survival is 30 to 50 percent. And these statistics has definitely improved, but not very much. We must be careful and we must be careful about prevent pollution, stop smoking, and we must avoid lung cancer. Survival without term treatment is rarely possible, and most untreated patients uh, usually die within one year. Median survival or untreatment is less than six months. Diagnostic model of lung cancer is all absolutely standardized now. X-ray, CT scan, bronchoscopy, virtual bronchoscopy, media scanscopy, PET scan, and EBUS. Perhaps everything has a role, and depending on need, we use this. So principle of lung cancer surgery, definitely non-small cell lung cancer, resection is the treatment, and usually lobectomy. So in some very, very advanced cases, we need to go for pneumonectomy or extended section. In some special cases, you can segmentectomy, but most of the cases are treated by lobectomy. And this is the policy I'm discussing about non-small cell lung cancer. But dear friends, let me remind you here, there's a group of patient of small cell lung cancer who are also subject of surgery. We are not discussing in details about lung cancer today, but for just brief information, non-small cell lung cancer is a disease amenable to surgery. Small cell lung cancer is largely treated by chemotherapy, but there is a small subset of patients or small cell lung cancer who are subject for surgery. And uh, a different sort of X-ray and uh, CT picture will get. A bronchoscopy may give you very good information, but this sort of tube are at the very advanced stage. An opening either by thoracotomy or where you will get this sort of lesion on the surface. And after this section, this is the picture of the tumor. And uh, details or further therapy will depend on the type of tumor. Bula, we had enough discussion earlier. It should not be confused with the pneumothorax and should not be drained. And that may lead to further problems of normal fistula. And once Bula is diagnosed, treatment is very simple. Today, most of the cases are treated by pets or by robots. And congenital lower impression on baby, that is very important. This is also where hyperinflation of a lobe of lung causes mediational shift. But once this baby is having thoracotomy, lung, the uh, lobe comes out and baby settles more dynamically. After treatment, babies are absolutely fine. So mediational cyst with tumor as discussed early. So with this background, I will take another maybe couple of minutes to express a couple of issues, which I think for my youngsters, for my young surgeons, those are my tips to travel across thoracic surgery horizon. A couple of tips, I feel it is important that association of lung cancer with pulmonary tuberculosis is very high. There's one subset where tuberculosis turned into cancer, TB cancer, that is very small number, but associated lung cancer with pulmonary tuberculosis is very high. Medicinal cold abscess, it is not uncommon and it needs to be worked up. Many a times we get cold abscess in the mediastinum and we must take it carefully. And cold abscess uh, requires dependent drainage. It must be remembered that cold abscess and tubercular abscess, if not drained properly, it may be residual abscess might lead to problems. So whether it is cold or hot, abscess must be drained in a dependent way. Association of varieties of congenital anomalies with pulmonary tuberculosis. This is a common finding in our country. We may open a lung or we may work out for a cavity of tuberculosis, but that patient might have a bullar. In many cases, while inside chest with a lung cancer or some hydrosis, something, we may find multiple bulla inside the lung. So for all practical purposes, we must be ready in this part of the world that all lung will have multiple lesions, may have multiple lesions. We must be ready for that. Don't think that all chest will be virgin without addition. In this part of the world, in our country, especially India and surrounding countries, 
it is very difficult to get a virgin church. Initially, uh, several debaters thought that heads is cannot be practiced here because most of the chests have an addition. Yes, most of the chests will get addition. There may not be history of TB, there may not be history of pneumonia, but we expect either extensive addition or some sort of addition in major chest. But that should not come in the way of hats or robots or procotomy. We must be careful with a mental makeup that you are going to get some addition in chest due to whatever is in open. Another issue I want to point out, the role of PET needs to be assessed very, very carefully. PET is not the last answer. In many of the cases, it is confusing, particularly where there is large burden of tuberculosis. So tubercular nodes, tubercular disease, sequelae, they may confuse. So in this part of the world, PET has got definite role, but there are a lot of negative PETs, and we must be careful. Drug resistance, either antibiotic resistance or tubercular drug resistance. This is very, very important issue. And I must raise the issue of empirical ATD. Still, it is practiced in this part of the world. And uh, rationality is definitely questionable, should not be given. I request my young friends, if you have got any suggestion of tuberculosis, it must be worked out before you take it to surgery. You must make confirmed, you treat adequately, but empirical AT drugs, for God's sake, should not be given. It has got a lot of hazards. It must not be given. At one time, it was very rampant. It has come down. But still, many patients get empirical TB. Simple bronchiectasis. They are sent to surgeon or reach a surgeon after getting anti therapy. So that practice must be stopped. Limpadnevathy. It must be taken seriously. All the nodes present in the chest may not be malignant, may not be tubercular. So a lot of nodes are reactionary nodes. And uh, the diagnosis and surgery is challenging. And healed fibrous nodes or tuberculosis may not be required to be resected. Dear friends, young friends, please remember, don't try to resect all the nodes if you have enough evidence to think that it is reaction nodes or fibrous nodes, tubercular nodes, non-malignant nodes. A node without having active tuberculosis or not being malignant. Simply long-standing fibrous node having a lot of addition Added all the important structures, vessel, bronchus, don't resect. So any node due to any other reason sitting in the chest does not take resection. That point must be kept in mind. Surgery for pulmonary tuberculosis. Most of the tubercular patients we treat for sequelae. Surgery for sequelae pulmonary tuberculosis. Usually bypass is not required, but you must be ready to have facilities. Sometimes it may require not regularly, but sometimes you may be in trouble. A technical point of view, if I discuss multi drug resistant tuberculosis, where you operate for tuberculosis, either cavity or non responder, surgery is less difficult. Surgery can be taken out nicely, but those where those cases where you perform surgery for sequelae of tuberculosis, surgery is most difficult, very demanding resection. You have to be careful, there is a lot of expected complications, so it must be handled very, very carefully. Surgery for non tubercular. Uh, surgery that is lung CA, hydrate, cavity. In all these cases, apical lesion may be very challenging. These are challenging. If you get some lesion sitting in the apex, either cancer lung or a cavity lung disease or a hydrate, hydrate may not put into a lot of problems, but cavity lung disease, particularly more than a lung CA. If there is cavity in the apical part of the lung, you must be very careful because apex is a very difficult area having large number of vessels. So here, Dissection is very important, and if we injure some structure, major vessel, it may be difficult to handle. So if it is apical lesion, please be very careful. And intrapericardial approach sometimes is an essential component of handling major vessels for lung dissection. But many times in our country, we get unrecognized chronic constant pericarditis because we have got large number of tuberculosis in our country. 30% of chronic constitutive pericarditis are tubercular. There is, there is no evidence. Patient didn't have anti-tubercular drug. There is no clinical evidence. But on biopsy, in 30% cases, we get chronic constitutive pericarditis of tubercular origin. And these cases, a thick peel of pericardium is densely adhered to all the structures of the heart or here. If you wish to enter the pericardium, you cannot go. So please get ready mentally. And in a couple of cases, 
you may badly require to enter pericardium but you cannot do it because it has got chronic constant pericardial disease so all this scenario must be remembered and these are all my thoughts to be transmitted to my young friends please remember thorax is a very difficult organ so you must be ready everything can be handled provided you are ready and you identified before creating problems so different lesions in different combination it is encountered if i have opened for lung cancer find a cavity or additional hydrity or a bulla so bulla associated with any other pathology is very common in almost all lung cancers elderly patient we get bulla in cavity lung disease we get some bulla so these are usual associations so multiple lung cavities or multiple specialization either the same lung or the other lung in the same lobe or other lobe this is also classical thing so these complicated lesions are all encountered so let me end by saying the thoracic surgery in tropical country is a different ball game and we encounter everything we get tb we get non tb and more so i will i would like to impress on you regarding those irregular protozoa parasite helminths they are not usual residents of thoracic cavity but sometimes they may love you they may enter the chest they may put you to trouble and if you are careful if you can suspect you can find a solution so dear friends i think uh, let us uh, now relax and uh, let us discuss at the table uh, whatever we have discussed we can take it forward by answering your queries thank you very much thank you very much uh, dr biswas uh, that was a amazing talk uh, half of the med uh, infestations i've never even heard of so <laughs> it's amazing to see uh, the kind of experience that you have over the years uh, so i am going to start some question answers uh, my first question is as a thoracic surgeon practicing in the tropics how do you diagnose these uh, unusual things you know are they diagnosed by serology or is there a tissue test how do you do that uh, particularly when you talk about ascariasis hookworms strongyloidosis i can't even pronounce it so how do you diagnose these things uh, in your uh, clinical practice uh, dr ali this is the question you have brought for me hard it is very difficult to make a diagnosis only thing i should say this is a strong suspicion and it comes by exclusion where all okay. the conventional uh, modes have been ruled out excluded so these are the issues particularly say i can say about uh, round worm the patient has history of amebiasis and uh, history of abdominal problem patient has passed round worm uh, sometimes in stool sometimes bilious vomiting i remember one case who had recurrent pneumonitis and uh, bronchitis of one lobe and he had a history of passing uh, round worm frequently and that patient came with a ct scan Uh, bronchitis after resection i got a dead full length worm if you remember oh. uh, some picture in uh, belly and lap surgery so uh, from biliary tract worm uh, whole length of one was found out so i got one worm from one lobe so these are by suspicion as exclusion many times uh, very difficult to assess but should be kept in mind so so have you operated on patients thinking that the diagnosis was something else uh, thinking it could be bronchitis or a lung cancer and then the histology came back as as uh, you know one of these tropical infestations have you had that experience yes sir pyliasis yes, yes i got it a solid uh, mass in the lobe lobectomy was done and biopsy yeah. showed that is pyliasis so pylia i got some experience round one i got some experience so this that rare sometimes you get but uh, uh, this is get and difficult to diagnose in most of the cases so, so so are you saying that you operated thinking this was uh, another pathology you did the lung resection and then the histology came back as yes pyloidosis is that what you are suggesting ah uh, pyloidia it came like that i could not get diagnosed very difficult situation sir very difficult situation okay so there are a couple of questions which have come from the audience this is such a difficult topic that uh, not many people have questions to ask as well but uh, one of the questions is with relation to the uh, bile drainage uh, for hydrated cyst of the liver he's mm -hmm. saying how do you manage persistent high bile drainage from liver cavity 
after removal of a hydrated cyst in case of lung and liver hydrated. So this is very important issue. So said, let us take uh, two issues separately. One issue is hydrated in the lung, hydrated in the liver. They have been operated by doing phrenotomy. A chest drain has been put and one drain below the diaphragm. This is one clinical scenario. Lung issue has been settled and there is continuous biliary drainage below the diaphragm. This is one okay. clinical setting. In that okay. case, put the drain for longer time. And uh, just uh, what happens in this case is bile collects, uh, bile comes out from the liver, that is between liver and the diaphragm. The whole peritoneal cavity is sealed. The tube has to be kept for longer time, gradually, gradually, collection comes down. This is one scenario. Another scenario that is uh, hepatopulmonary fistula, biliary fistula. That is a very difficult issue. The liver abscess, rupturing through the diaphragm, entering the lobe. So that is lung abscess and uh, biliary collection. In that cases, I have an experience of two cases where I have to reoperate due to recurrence. So open the liver, open the thorax first, whole dissection, then through the diaphragm, then fistula tract was open, cavity was open, diaphragm was put below, and now lobectomy was done. And uh, after six, seven days, started leaking bile. So all investigations uh, were done, nothing was shown. I had to re-explore. Lung was okay. And very difficult to find out. Then phrenotomy was again done. And then resected the remaining uh, some thin portion of liver. And uh, some muscle flap was taken from the chest, was put on the diaphragm level. And one case, uh, the greater amount was put. So these are very difficult situations, very difficult situation. If it is only liver, the drain has to be kept for longer time, make sure that it is not communicating to the general peritoneal cavity. And here you have to take help of general surgeon. If it is on the chest, that has to be dealt from chest angle. So do you change your incision from a thoracotomy to a thoracolaprotomy, or you just do thoracotomy, phrenotomy, and then deal with the liver? Earlier uh, in my practice, I was fond of thoracolaparotomy, but now I have stopped it with thoracotomy and phrenotomy, you get adequate access. And the cutting through chest and abdomen gives a very, very bad incision, pain, complications. So I have avoided that for quite long years. I don't do it. It is and sometimes it required you can put a camera and do that job in laparoscopy if you need below. Yeah. Uh, one of the things, as I, as I said in your last lecture as well, is uh, if you're dealing with liver and you've got a wide surface where you're worried that you will leak bile, then use of argon plasma coagulation is actually recommended. The liver surgeons do a lot of, uh, uh, when they do a segmentectomy of the liver, they use argon plasma coagulation to cut through the liver. And that is supposed to be biliostatic, which means it stops uh, bile leaking from the raw surface of the liver. So uh, at least uh, nowadays, if, if you are going to be doing a liver uh, hydrated at the same time as you're doing a lung hydrated, and you find that you're, uh, because you've done a capitonage and the, you've left a large raw surface, then it's worth buzzing the whole surface with argon plasma coagulation. And that actually is known to reduce the incidence of uh, biliary leak. Yes, uh, we've got Dr. Sorry. Carry on, uh, sir. Uh, you carry on, carry on. Uh. No, but Dr. Divan actually is asking us uh, in terms of biliary bronchial fistula, mm -hmm. can, a, can veg resection be preferred over lobectomy to preserve lung parenchyma? That's his first yes. question. Uh, yes, yes. Yes, uh, well, uh, let, uh, but, should I answer this part and then... Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I'll ask you the second one. Uh, for this, uh, yes, that is the principle of lung conservation. Yes, 100% we must conserve that but most of the cases of this sort of fistula when the patient reach you it involves the lower lobe whatever number of cases i have experienced i could not preserve but as a matter of principle these are non-malignant disease if possible you have to try to preserve it but whatever number of cases i operated because the whole lobe was gone so it was lower resection okay uh, in fact there are two more questions from dr divan so i'll i'll read the next one says mm -hmm. some tropical diseases are location specific mm -hmm. and some different parasites are seen in South America and Middle East. 
Sir, would you like to comment? Yes, yes. Every parasite has got one uh, area of choice. Majority like to harbor in lower lobes. Some parasites harbor are multiple nodules. So left and right choice has not been established in literature. But lower lobe, upper lobe choice has been established. Majority of parasites like to harbor in lower lobes. And couple of parasites would like to have multiple miliary lesions. So uh, information literature is not uh, very exhaustive, but whatever, we are not aware of that. So, but uh, usually these are in lower lobes or multiple lesions. There is no uh, specific choice for left or right. But I have a limited experience, not too many. But, but but what what do you know about the geographical distribution? Is, is it something different in other continents? Uh, does Dr. Divan have more experience about this? Can he come in and tell us about the various geographical areas, whether, uh, you know, are the worms different? Yes. Uh, uh, good evening, everybody. Hi, good, good, evening, good evening, sir. Welcome, welcome. Yeah. Yeah, I was think, saying that uh, functional strong, strongula iodosis is uh, more common in Egypt and near Middle East than in India. Uh, and there are para, paragonium, I can't even know, as you know, <laughs> yeah. up that in South America, a different subset of uh, parasites are common, helminth infestations mm -hmm. are common. In India, we but see... But do they, do they affect the lungs, sir? Occasionally, they do. Occasionally, they do. I've seen occasional case reports. So okay. the situation changes according to the location and what kind of parasites you see. Of course, those things are becoming less common. For instance, even this thing, called the tapeworm or even this, uh, this hookworm, they, that also sometimes reaches lungs and causes the same situations like tropical eosinophilia. And then they are very difficult to diagnose. If there's an associated anemia, then some very smart and clever experienced physician may occasionally diagnose and think about it and give you a preoperative diagnosis and maybe not refer to you for surgery. But I think most of the time we do surgery not really because the lung has been destroyed and the parenchymal lesion is causing hemoptysis or something. So we have done an appropriate lung resection and then we come to know oh, there was an underlying parasitic infestation also. Do, do these parasites cause empyema in any in your experience? Have either of you seen empyema as a problem or a rupture of a lung abscess into the pleural space? I have seen only maybe amoebic liver abscess causing empyema. Amoebic liver okay. very often. That is. I see. Okay. And sir, Dr. Dr. Lee, uh, if I make a comment, that the amoebic liver abscess rupturing into pleural cavity and producing empyema is uh, rare, but uh, we get quite a good number of cases, particularly in this part of the country. Patient present okay. with uh, liver abscess and then empyema, and they are treated in the usual manner. But other parasitic disorders are not common. Lung abscess, empyema, these are common. And sometimes, that, uh, uh, as I told you, I have very limited experience of phyliasis. Mm -hmm. After resection of solid mass, it came to phyliasis. And others, in most of the cases, diagnosis is incidental. Maybe after all, everything and the biopsy. And majority treatment is medical therapy and surgery just incidentally. We have operated, got the diagnosis and treated, not diagnosed early, except in that uh, you know, round one, I have told you, round one, yes, uh, quite a good number of cases, not too many, but at least a couple of examples, couple of instances I remember. Round one, uh, in one case, in bronchoscopy, pyrotic, I saw a tail of the round one. And then CT showed the destroyed lower lobe. These are very, very funny experience, but I don't think these are frequent now. Last several years, very rarely you get, but these are in existence still now. What is your experience? I have operated on somebody who turned out to be cystic sarcosis. And then eventually he also had a brain lesion, uh, which we didn't pick up in the first uh, analysis. Uh, have you come across cystic sarcosis? Cystic sarcosis usually produce small, small lesion. Yes. Uh, uh, cystic, uh, what happened? Uh, opening chest due to bulla. I can recall it just at this point of at least one case. Open for bulla getting small, small lesion over the lung and uh, taken biopsy and that came to cystic sarcosis. And they had no uh, neurological uh, evidence earlier. And then uh, post-op CT and MRI also didn't show. So mm -hmm. these are unusual uh, 
Yeah, the one I took out was actually presented as a chest wall tumor. It presented as a lump underneath the chest wall. And we took it out, we didn't know, we didn't think about it. And eventually it turned out to be a cysticercosis. I, I was very surprised. I had never seen anything like that. So the other question which Dr. Divan has asked you is, what's your experience and thoughts about pseudotumors? Uh, we see them. So that's that's a good one. Uh, Pseudotumor. Uh, Pseudotumor uh, is uh, uh, not uncommon. It is not very rare. And uh, the number of pseudotumors have come down. Reason being, most of the tumors are not diagnosed. What is my feeling earlier, couple of tumors where we fail to reach the tumor have a histological diagnosis. Those group of tumors are diagnosed as pseudotumors. But now the number of pseudotumors have come down. But still, there are a couple of cases. Sir, please start by explaining to the young surgeons what is a pseudotumor. Pseudotumors means it is a solid tumor-like structure. It is made of fibrosis only, couple of lesions giving extensive fibrosis. That is extreme uh, sort of fibrosis from an inflammatory lesion. It is not malignant. It is not neoplastic. Some inflammatory lesion may be as after effect of granulomatous disease. So after granulomatous disease, there is healing, there is fibrosis, and overreaction of fibrous tissue and looks like a solid tumor. In Clinically, they may present with chest pain, cough, discomfort, and over the period of time, that may remain of the same size. These are not solitary pulmonary nodules, bigger than that, but they don't grow. And many a times, FNSC doesn't give you information. It gives you inconclusive information. Uh, this is the usual nature, and uh, when there is, it is bigger than solitary pulmonary nodule, and there is doubt, even it is not growing, it's better to take out, and today, with the camera, you can take it now. It's 90, and uh, biopsy gives you final diagnosis. Okay. Dr. Divan wanted to say something. He raised his hand, I saw. Yes. I was saying that about this cysticercosis, in fact, uh, without naming, I have seen a medical colleague getting a brain cysticercosis as well as a chest cysticercosis. So it is a mm -hmm. thing which is rare, but it is occasionally seen. It's unfortunately seen by diagnosis is quite challenging. But of course, as you said, you it presented chest wall abscess in your case, but because X-ray chest is done very often in our institutions. So a colleague who has presented with convulsions was diagnosed with neurocysticercosis had a chest lesion also. So I've also seen one. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, so the next question is uh, about uh, hydrated disease. Uh, you, you mentioned uh, pair therapy. Uh, and I was going to ask the question as well, but somebody from the audience has asked. Uh, PEAR as a treatment in liver hydrated disease. Uh, is PEAR a contraindication in lung hydrated due to the risk of rupture? Uh, uh, contra for the last part, I could, the last part, what is the, the, the question part? is that mm -hmm. PEAR, the percutaneous aspiration yes. Uh, yes. Uh, and installation of scolicidal mm -hmm. has been described as a therapy for liver hydrated. Is, is it a contraindication for lung hydrated or is it a treatment method for lung hydrated as well? It is not a routine therapy for lung hydrated. Uh -huh. But a group of physicians has treated a group of very, uh, very uh, limited lower lower lesion with pair. And uh, they have reported good outcome. It is not a routine for lung hydrated. But aren't you worried about plural contamination when you're trying to go trans transcutaneous into the hydrated cyst? Yes, sir. that is a major concern. So in lung hydrated, it is almendazole. And uh, if it is uncomplicated, smaller hydrated, 30% chance of regression or disappearance. Otherwise, you have to go for surgery. And in almost all cases, it can be removed without resecting lung. So PR is not classical for lung. It is for liver only. Though some report has been uh, published, but uh, most of the are not convinced. I personally don't like, I have not done it. Okay. Now, just one point I want to, I want to ask you to clarify for our exam going people, uh, because we are on hydrated uh, thing. So I know you mentioned it in your talk last week, but uh, what is the, uh, extent of uh, anti uh, extent of the medical treatment that you should give before 
doing hydrated surgery and how long should you give this treatment after doing the surgery? Uh, this is very, very important question. This is very, very important yes, concern that I should say in real time million dollar question. How long to continue? There is no specific guideline anywhere. But for all practical purpose, we have to start albendazole if your situation permits at least three weeks before surgery, you must start it. It has to be continued at least for three to six months, keeping an eye on liver enzymes. But there are a couple of exceptions. If it is multi-site hydrative, one liver, one lung, or left lung, right lung, or multiple hydrative, or recurrent hydrative, then it is uh, recommended to continue for longer time. Probably in last uh, discussion, I have quoted out a couple of my examples. One girl I still remember, he came from Maldai, district of West Bengal. I operated her 12 years back. She came with a big hydrated cyst. Treatment was given, albendazole continued for six months. And after one year, she came with multiple hydrated both the lung. So two of them are removed, second sitting. And then I continued with uh, albendazole. And uh, after six months, when it stopped, small, small hydrated came. Again, started that patient is on albuterol therapy more than 10 years now. Only what I do after three, four months, stop for two, three weeks, check uh, liver enzymes. So this is extreme example, particularly echinococcus granulosus. That is the breed. That is the, uh, they cause uh, this sort of recurrence. So particularly as it is stated now, that recurrent hydratid, multi-site hydratid, multiple hydratid, these are the cases where it has to be continued for longer time. But by and large, starting three weeks before surgery and continuing for six months is enough for majority of the patients, unless there is other indication. It should be stopped after six months. So just want to make a comment on this, just for clarification for the youngsters. Why, why sir, has said three weeks before surgery is that if you give it for a longer time before surgery, then intraoperative rupture or preoperative rupture of the hydrated cyst is, is likely. And that is what most of the literature says, that uh, if, you, know, you give it only for 14 days to 21 days. If you give it for a longer time before surgery, then when you get in, there are more chances because the tissue liquefies and your planes are not well preserved. You have a risk of rupture. And it might actually rupture before you operate in there. So yeah, risk of recurrence then increases with the rupture. That is what uh, literature says. Yes. Do you agree, sir? Or, uh, yes, yes. Uh, I and if you permit me, I can add one more sentence. Yes, sir, please. You may not be that fortunate that it will rupture outside. It may rupture inside bronchial tree. Oh, so, that is even worse. A couple of cases sure. have reported where after almondazole, the cyst has ruptured and has been expected out through. So he's fortunate the patient has expected out. Maybe a couple of patients did not reach as well, they might have dead. So sure. if you start albendazole, you must be ready to operate within next three weeks, this is the usual practice. Yeah. In, in multilocularis, there is evidence of more endobronchial rupture, and they will cough out grape-like structures. This is a classical description in the textbooks, that they cough out grapes. Yes, yes. They, they wonder what it is, and it is actually hydrated multilocularis, and then this, these have been treated with albendazole for longer than uh, three months, uh, lo longer than three weeks. Yes, they are classical daughters. Classical uh, daughters, the small, small daughters. Daughters, yeah, absolutely. Sir, continuing the same question, mm -hmm. I'm going to ask you in aspergilloma. I, I heard you say on your slides that there is no role for antifungals in a localized aspergilloma. I, I just want you to clarify this statement, sir. Mm -hmm. So regarding this issue, uh, probably we have discussed across the table also multiple times. Yes, yes. <laughs> ordinary... But for the audience, for the youngsters, uh, sir, yes, I want for, you to for, yeah, put I'm your sorry. views forward and then I'll I'll put my views uh, forward. Sir. So my views is this aspergilloma, they are pre-existing tubercular cavity or non-tubercular cavity and the fungal ball that comes from here and there is no evidence of systemic fungal infection. If it is, there is no role of antifungal. But if there is evidence of any evidence, clinical evidence or anything about systemic fungal infection, there is role of antifungal. As a routine, what is in my practice, I don't give uh, antifungal, take out it. 
if there is any evidence of fungal infection, it is added later. As a routine, I don't add. Uh, but I, I don't restrict myself that I am not going to add. If there's evidence, okay. I don't add. So, so my take on this is a bit different. Uh, it comes from a clinical experience of a few patients who, when you go in and operate, you actually manipulate the uh, uh, aspergilloma, you manipulate the lung when you're dissecting things out. And there is a risk that you might, be, because these guys are known to have endobronchial communications. And so there is a risk that you might cause sy systemic fungal sepsis. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so in my personal practice, what I do is I give them antifungals for about six weeks before I start, the, before I schedule them for surgery. Because at the time of the surgery, I want to have peak plasma level of antifungals. So what happens is you do a very good surgery, but unfortunately four days, five days later, they start developing some haziness in the other lung, which is clearly a sign that you have actually spilled the fungus over. But since we have started doing this uh, six weeks of antifungal before doing an aspergilloma, we've actually had no cases who have had uh, fungal sepsis. Could be that our technique has become better, or could be that, uh, you know, we, we don't have a scientific answer for this, but it's just a gut feeling. And so we personally start six weeks before, give anti antifungals, take out the aspergilloma, and, and my pulmonologist likes to give for three months following the surgery. That is her standard practice, and I'm quite happy with that. Dr. Divan, do you have a difference of opinion? Uh, yeah, I, I mentioned in my talk two days ago also this thing uh, came up. I think that fungus is just a colonized. Aspergilloma has three different presentations. Number one is systemic aspergillosis, which is a very serious condition which requires antifungal drugs for sure. Second is ABPA, allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis, which presents as asthma, which requires yeah. corticosteroids in addition to fungal drugs. But the surgical thing that we are most often encountering is an aspergilloma in a pre-existing cavity. And very often it is just a colonization. So antifungal is not necessary, but if the post-operative biopsy shows fungal uh, invasion into the vessels, which sometimes does take place, it is not always very innocuous and it cannot be 100% sure that in all cases it is colonization. So if we find evidence of colon this invasion of vessels, then we add antifungals for four to six weeks under physician's guidance. And earlier, most of us as senior surgeons have been wary of giving antifungals because amphotericin was the only antifungal available, which was so toxic Then generally the drugs used to kill the patient rather than the surgery. So we used to avoid it. But now with other fluconazole and other drugs being available, yeah. probably your concept is also perfectly valid, though we cannot have a scientific reason. Yeah, we don't have a scientific basis for yeah. that. It's just Ali, a gut feeling. Ali, yes, sir. I, I would like to add one more sentence. Yes, sir. So this issue is a, a very, very burning topic we have thought uh, and uh, what you have discussed already that uh, there are connections and that invade the surrounding tissue. And uh, mm -hmm. this issue has been discussed and this issue has been studied and published also. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, in one study, it came and it was discussed that this percolation doesn't cross the boundary of lobe. So in the fungal wall aspergilloma, the recommended surgery is not limited. It is always, always lobectomy. It has, uh, in that particular study, it was proved. If you, these connections doesn't cross the beyond bound, uh, boundary of a lobe. Uh -huh. So in aspergilloma, limited resection is not recommended because if you do segmentectomy, uh, it may invade next segment. But of course, what you suggest that may be studied that limited resection with antifungal. That okay. may be solution. Okay. So these are open and I think young stars will find answer for these issues. Sure, sure. Now the next question has come from the audience, sir. Any role for surgery in removal of a pseudopancreatic cyst extending from retroperitoneum to mediastinum? Ah, I, I don't know, sir. <laughs> <laughs> if something comes, uh, I, 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 I don't even know what is a pseudopancreatic cyst. <laughs> we don't have to in this. All right, sir, we, we let that one be, sir. Okay, so the next question is, in surgical treatment for pulmonary hydrated, a capitonage for a medium-sized cyst, after closure of the bronchial openings and capitonage, 
The remaining lung appears crumpled and produces atelectatic shadows on radiographs. Mm. Do they resolve on their own? Most of the lung, after capital nerve, if the bronchus is slowed, it comes up. Particularly in pediatric population, yeah. it comes 100%. I have very, very rare experience of going for resection. In high dated, lung is always, always conservable. This is what I feel. Okay. Right. So, so the lung expands and uh, expands. somebody had asked last time whether is there a distortion of the geometry of the lung. The answer is no, because the lung is very, very, it's, it's a friend, really a good friend who is very forgiving. And ah, yes, always, yes, no matter what you do to the lung, yes, it actually yes. recovers beautifully. In and that's why thoracic surgery is so nice. In hydrated lung comes up. Lung yes. does it. Uh, even... Uh, those uh, lung which looks like just a leather, if you close the bronchus and on table you get some evidence that is expanding, it is not totally solid, it comes up. Okay. Sir, the comment has come back regarding the uh, uh, excessive bile leak that you are getting after uh, liver resection is that uh, they have managed such cases with endoscopic sphincterotomy. Uh, so that bile flows freely into the duodenum and the leak stops. So this is a comment from, I'm assuming this is a, a, a abdominal surgeon who knows uh, these things better than we do, sir. Uh, okay. Um, the next question is, is there any cutoff based on the percentage of the volume of the lung tissue occupied by the hydrated to make a decision for upfront lung resection? No, no, no. No. So you, no. you just, the, the aim is to take the cyst out, that's it. it ah, that's happen. cyst out and close the bronchus. That's and, cyst. and save lung. Ah, save lung, yes, it will come up. Should patients with hydrated cyst uh, on admission during pre-op, should patients of hydrated cyst be admitted uh, during pre-operative albendazole therapy given the risk of intrabronchial rupture? Already discussed this issue. Uh, there is chance yeah. of rupture, but the PVX is reasonable. Uh, yeah, but you don't admit them to the hospital, do you? You uh, don't do that. No, 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 so no that's no not routine. Point, but, uh, there's no point in admitting so early. Yeah, there's no point. It yeah. comes ready. So, yeah, so is there any role for amphotericin installation for aspergilloma? Uh, that issue, uh, local aspiration, uh, you, you have experience, you can say, I don't have experience. Probably local in. Uh, institution doesn't have any role. I, I don't have any personal experience. You can make comment on this. I see. Okay, a uh, couple of questions while we have you with us. Uh, this is outside the topic, sir. This is this. These are questions which have been asked on the forum, and yeah. and because you are with us, and if it's okay, and you've got some time. Yes, I sir. want you to comment on this, sir. This, this is quite important. This couple of these questions have come from young surgeons who have just started their practices. So they, they are asking, how do they start a VATS program uh, from scratch uh, in, in their center? So I would like to ask your opinion on this, sir. And I would like Dr. Divan also to give some uh, words of wisdom because he started his, his program from scratch. So can you help these youngsters? What are the philosophies for starting a VATS program? Again, yes, it's not related to this topic, but yes, very sir. important for the but audience. It is not related, but it is highly related. <laughs> because yes, now, uh, minimal invasive VATS is expert. I have got a, uh, my uh, planning in this, which I practiced in my medical college, that my policy, because now the people who are coming for thoracic surgery, they have got reasonable experience of handling laparoscope. They are having some experience of handling camera so they can do it so it has to be taken in the same line in the training of thoracic surgery training of uh, usual thoracic surgery my initial training in my department was that there is a uh, very frequent need to put chest drain in many cases maybe pleural effusion maybe pneumothorax in a medical college where cost doesn't bother you so mm -hmm. I made a plan for all patients to put a camera while putting chest drain. Just put a camera in the department is free. Large number of patients are coming. Put a camera seat. And particularly in trauma patient, all trauma patients having little bit blood, hemothorax, pneumothorax, putting a camera was a routine. And uh, last day I discussed, I got a couple of cases 
reading from the intercostal vessel just putting at least solve the problem so my policy was to put the camera in all the chest wherever you can put maybe perfusion maybe uh, pneumothorax or maybe chest trauma next issue is uh, all the uh, uh, young surgeons who have reasonable experience of laparoscopy that uh, that is a important issue they must remember so some experience of laparoscopy basic training in thoracic surgery basic anatomy physiology couple of thoracic cases and putting laparoscope uh, in all the chest and starting with minimal or small procedure uh, just like uh, plural biopsy not lung biopsy initially so just plural biopsy uh, uh, then looking inside the chest very carefully so uh, undiagnosed plural effusion that is common case so this is the couple of points i thought one is some experience of laparoscopy some experience of thoracic surgery and putting camera very very frequently to be very very conversant to see inside chest to identify right left up left and do small procedures to start with mostly plural biopsy that is starting then you have to pick up slowly this is my feeling okay dr divan what was your experience when you started your vats program I in the government that, setup that is a great question i suppose it should uh, first of all i should make the comment that dr zamir yourself have made us realize that wax is possible in inflammatory lung disease it's not a contraindication and but one has to be more ingenious and as dr vishwas has said that you can start with procedures where you feel that you can enter the chest easily and then then start putting them you routinely in all the cases even though you may be ready to convert easily in beginning and it is easier in multidisciplinary institutions where laparoscope is already available so you don't have to invest separately on vats Uh, camera etc you put laparoscope in all your thoracic cases and then see if you can progress and most important have a younger person in your team who can do vats much more easily than us okay uh, i i just want to add my two piece on this is that uh, for a vats program uh, we we there is an organized training program it's called as a four stage uh, i forget the name now the, it's it's a four stage program where you have to come in and uh, you have to first attend a wet lab uh, the wet lab is for basic vats in the basic vats we actually teach you about instrumentation uh, we teach you about uh, uh, hand eye coordination and then we teach you about five simple thoracic operations uh, so it's called as a perceptor course that's right it's a perceptor course uh, which ethicon and covidian both are doing actually so the first step is you come into the wet, basic vats wet lab the second step is you come into the theater of the of the of the leader of the perceptor course and you watch uh, at least 5 uh, to 6 operations uh, the third step is where the perceptor comes into your theater stands opposite you while you set up uh, basic uh, uh, cases and then the fourth step is advanced uh, course so you have to come back and do all three all over again and where the perceptor comes back into your uh, into your theater after you've seen him in his theater and then of course the follow up is on online support with videos and uh, counseling and this uh, has been supported by ethicon and has also been supported by covidian as as a protocolized program but i really feel that the ists should now take over this responsibility uh, because we are now live uh, so ists should take over this responsibility of doing the perceptor course for training youngsters for vats it, it's only a suggestion sir but uh, i think it's this should be the main mandate of of our society now what do you think uh, this is a very right suggestion totally i fully agree with you so in today's scenario the initial training and this simulation these are uh, very valid and definitely society should take it forward and uh, you are part of all our teaching programs you being the youngest and most dynamic person so you are always <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, yeah. 
Thank you, you sir. Not only that you have suggested, but you have been doing this. So it has okay, to be sir, we... regularly. <laughs> we will get on to the next question, sir. Uh, what is your? Somebody has asked me that they have been asked by surgical gastroenterology, uh, gastroenterology to insert an ICD into a pseudopancreatic cyst. Uh, what does that mean, sir? I see it in the pseudopancreatic cyst. Yeah, they can. I don't know. They can under lepers under USG guide. They can put a tube. What is our role? I really. Okay. Remember. And uh, the other thing is, I, I want to clarify. Somebody has written to me saying, describing what a pseudopancreatic cyst is. So thank you, but uh, <laughs> I promise you, I know what is a pseudopancreatic cyst. I was only joking when I said I don't know it. It's just that we don't deal with it often enough. So we are not experts. To give you advice on what is the management of a pseudopancreatic cyst. Uh, so that's that. Uh, any other questions which uh, people want to ask? Uh, feel free to step in and ask. Otherwise, we'll call it a day. I think it's been a wonderful learning experience for all of us, sir. Uh, anybody's got anything burning issues you want to ask? Did Aparesh want to say something about the pseudopancreatic cyst? You're very upset about it. So go ahead and come in and say something about it, please. About your case. Hello? All right. Okay. So, so nobody is saying anything more. So we'll call it a day. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. a lot, sir. It's been a good, uh, really All learning. Yeah. In so tomorrow, tomorrow, sir, we have two lectures. Uh, uh, one lecture is at 3 p.m. Uh, GMT, London time. Uh, so which is, I think, uh, I don't know what is India time. 7.30, which is overlapping with a cardiac lecture. So we yeah. will continue to relay and whoever wants to listen to it should listen. It's a very important lecture. It's on tumor immunology. So yes. immunobiology of a tumor. And uh, Professor Akif Turna will actually give this lecture from uh, Istanbul. Uh, he's he's got an amazing research uh, program and very knowledgeable about lung cancer and mm -hmm. i would highly recommend every thoracic dedicated thoracic guy to attend this lecture because it's not often that you get to hear about immunology and we don't understand it uh, very well and immunotherapy is definitely uh, one of the new topics uh, around town which get asked in the exam surprisingly so I would suggest that you do listen to tumor immunology. It's quite important. We need to understand what are the things. And the second lecture is at our standard time, 9.30 India time, 5 p.m. And we are very fortunate to have Professor uh, Rajan Santosham, who's going to talk to us about surgery of the trachea. Uh, and, and, you know, he's one of the world experts in these sort of uh, operations. So looking forward to meeting all you guys tomorrow. Thank you, Professor Bishwas. Thank you, Dr. Devan. It's been a Real honor and a privilege to host this uh, program on your behalf. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much.